first of all, we thank you for your glory, your, your, just your majesty. Father, we thank you that you have a peace about you that transcends what we would think of peace. Father, we thank you for lifting us and keeping us when we don't want to go on ourselves. We thank you for strengthening our hearts, our minds, and our spirits when we want to just sit down and do nothing. But Father, we can't do that because we believe in you. And we're followers of you, Father, so we have to be in your image. We cannot be like you, but we can try to be like you. So Father, we thank you for your ever presence in our lives. We thank you for this Sunday school class. Father. There are people, people in other countries that can't gather like this. We thank you for the freedoms that we have, Father, because there are those who will be beheaded, literally, for even uttering your name. Father, we can wear what we want, speak what we want, do what we want, and go where we want. But Father, we want to speak your truth. Go where you will have us go. Do what you will have us do. Because Father, there's no other person that we want to follow. Father. So we thank you again for this class. We lift up the Sunday school teacher. We pray that you continue to touch his life. We know that you've anointed to study. Now we pray that you will give him the strength and the character and all that he would need to deliver his message. That will be your message. Father, we lift up everyone who's here and those who cannot make it. We ask that you touch them. Those who are sick, Father, we ask that you touch their bodies and heal them. Yes. We ask that you touch those who have been in surgeries, those who have been down with a cold or fever or whatever, Father. We ask that you touch them and lift them. Give them strength to at least hear your word today, if not read your word. So we thank you and we praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. So glad to see everyone out once again this morning beautiful and hot June 9th. Today we're in our summer quarter and it feels it. Unit 1, Experience and Hope. Lesson 2, June 9th, 2024. Our devotional reading will come from Deuteronomy 31, 1 through 8. Our background scripture will come from 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 18. Our print passage will come from 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 18. Our key verse will be saying our reading unison will come from 2 Corinthians 3, 18, King James Version. Our lesson topic is Reflecting God's Spirit. As a result of experiencing this lesson, we the participants should be able to identify and explain the relationship between faith and boldness, recognize the nature of the transformation that comes from God, and model the freedom of a life transformed by Christ. This lesson matters because people often become defensive and retreat when someone challenges their credentials. How do we proclaim truth boldly in the face of such challenges? Paul declared that he was able to speak with greater boldness because of the evidence of believers transformed lives. The lesson and focus tell us those calls to pastoral ministry, pastoral ministry, and between God and humanity as an intercessor, and a voice to present the salvation available through faith in Jesus Christ. This high calling has its challenge specifically among those they serve who critically evaluate their character and credentials. No matter who they are, pastors face numerous challenges. Churches claim they must learn more if they are younger than most of the congregation. If the pastor is a senior adult, many call them old and out of step. When pastors preach against sin, members consider them to be too strict and traditional, traditional yet accuse them of compromising and promoting peace over purity if they do not. Without seminary training and multiple degrees, the pastor is ill-prepared to preach and lead, some say, while accusing those with stellar academic credentials of preaching over the head of the Congress. Have people forgotten that pastors and spiritual leaders are as human as those they lead, despite the validity of their calling? Pastors are vulnerable to discouragement, anxiety, and frustration when people reject or dismiss their credentials. Despite Paul's call and commission to preach the gospel and lead people to Christ, he was discouraged by the false teachers who infiltrated the church and challenged their character and credentials. Second Corinthians revealed Paul's painful response and defense against the lives of his enemies and their attempt to discredit him and his apostolic authority. Rather than vulnerable attack his opponents, Paul urged the Corinthians to view the spiritual transformation they experienced through his ministry as evidence of his God-given spiritual authority. The Biblical in Context. The text of the epistle name Paul as the author of 2 Corinthians. Biblical scholars say the text writing around AD 55 to 57. Paul 
established the church in Corinth during his second missionary journey and remained there for one and a half years. Before writing his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul had written to the church addressing some serious issues that threatened the church's unity. Self styled false prophets infiltrated the Corinthian church, attacking Paul's character and promoted false teaching that caused discord among his members. According to specific responses by Paul and attempts to assassinate his character, these false prophets questioned his fidelity, even fidelity, and refused to accept financial support from the Corinthian church. These accusations against Paul's character and apostolic authority also accused him of self promotion. Paul addressed this issue in 2 Corinthians 3, where he challenged his opponents to look at themselves to validate his ministerial role and acknowledge God's power as the source of his strength to minister the new covenant of grace. He then compared the old covenant based on the Mosaic law to the new covenant of faith in Christ to prove his superiority. Amen. Amen. Now let's look at the devotional reading, which comes to the Romans 31, 1 through 8. And Moses went and spoke these words unto all the Israel. And he said unto them, I am a hundred and twenty years old. This day I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord has said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this, this door. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them in Joshua. He shall go over thee, go, go over before thee as the Lord has said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he had did to Dion and to all or king of Am the Amorites and into the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face that ye may do unto them according to unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, it is that does go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with his people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto thy father to give <clears throat> to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that does go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, nor nor be forsake thee, nor to be dismayed. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 3 18, King James Version. Once again, our lesson topic is reflecting God's Spirit, and we'll turn our lesson over to our teacher to examine it. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's a blessing to see everyone here this morning. And we're thankful that God has allowed us to come together again. Uh, good morning, Pastor. Uh, great lesson before this morning. Reflecting God's spirit. Reflecting God's spirit. Now, when the writer of this lesson come up with that title, who was he addressing to reflect God's spirit? Us, that's right. And just a moment ago when Nikki was reading, and I used one of them reading, I uh, jot down a question that came to my mind, and that question is, why do members hold the church leaders to a higher standard than they hold themselves? That's a good question. Members 
hold the leadership to a higher standard than they hold themselves. Mm. Well, let me go back for a moment and read something that Nikki read in our lesson and focus. And she's to have people forgotten that pastors and spiritual leaders are as human as those they lead. Despite the validity of their calling, pastors are vulnerable to discouragement, anxiety, and frustration when people reject or dismiss their credentials. This comes from a conversation that we was having. And in this lesson, when I got there and I was doing some more study, the answer that we was ping-ponging, the question we were ping-ponging back and forth. Mm. The question was, the answer was right there. And we're going to get to it in a little bit. We're going to go on with our first outline. God's given confidence. We're going to ask someone to read verses 5 and 6. And then read down to the end of From God in verse 6 of your book. Okay? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the, of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. As he defended this ministerial commission, Paul was aware of his opponent's tactics and realized that anything he said in his defense would be turned against him. His initial question in verse 1 indicates that these false apostles had resorted to this strategy before. Further, Paul realized that they would think he had no one else to recommend him and possessed no letters of recommendation to verify his authenticity as apostle. Therefore, Paul named the Corinthian believers as his letters of recommendation, written by God and confirmed by the transformation of their lives because of his ministry among them. Unlike the false prophets who boasted in themselves, Paul acknowledged that God alone was the source of his confidence and competence in mystery, in ministry. Excuse me. His confidence in the Corinthians as his letter of recommendation was based on the Holy Spirit's work in them. God's power was the foundation of their faith. Likewise, Paul's confidence as minister of the gospel and his sufficiency also came wholly from God. Amen. Thank you, Lon. God given confidence. Now, Paul had dressed with the Corinthian church and the credibility that Paul had was that his preaching and his teaching should reflect in their lives. There was some that was reflecting the change, and there was some that was going back and listening to the false teachers and the, the narrative that Paul did not have a letter, or Paul, he had a letter, but he was thinking that his credentials, they were saying that his credentials were not enough. And the only thing he could have was what he had done to impact other people's lives. And I was thinking about this last night. The only thing that I can do as a teacher is teach the truth. Some of it will fall on good soil. Some of it will fall on stony ground. Fire the air will snatch it out. Before it sinks in. But then, to go back to my question, is why is it that they hold leadership higher than they do themselves? Well, one thing about this, and I want to clear this up, is that we can do all the teaching that we can. Pastor can do all the preaching that he can. But he can't save nobody. I can't save nobody. 
the lesson is going to talk about the veil. And, and, and read on why people will come in and sit Sunday after Sunday and, and month after month and no change because they refuse to move the veil from their heart. You remember the veil in the temple was ran when Jesus was on the cross. It gave us access to God. So when we have a veil, a person have a veil over their heart, that means that they will not they is not giving God access to the armor. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, so the Jewish faction among the members of the Corinthian church accused Paul of not being a true apostle because the church in Jerusalem had not given him letters of recommendation. The false prophet boasts that they carried a letter of recommendation verifying their authenticity from recognized authority in the Jerusalem church. Paul, however, stated that the evidence of the Corinthian, Corinthian chain lies was a more credible validation of his ministry, authority, than human letters of, of recommendation. To avoid any accusation of boasting about himself, Paul quickly acknowledged that his confidence and sufficiency were in God. Paul insists that his ministry, mysterious competency, came from God. The apostle was not demonstrating false humility. Rather, he was acknowledging that he could do nothing in his own strength and wisdom. God was Paul's source. And it's not by uh, credential. See, what, what had happened today is that we, we look at Hey. And I, I, I can give late Reverend Stenson a lot of accolades for what he said one time. When I was young, uh, real young, and he was talking about people going. There's nothing wrong with going to seminary, there's nothing wrong with that. But without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, no one will be effective. Okay? No one would be effective. You think about this, this same guy here, Paul, when, when he was Saul, he had his letter. He said at the feet of Gamaliel, he had his lamb skin on the wall, but until he had that Damascus road experience, when, when Jesus, when God called him and, and, and changed his mindset, he became effective. The other side of that, when he had his lamb skin and all his work and all that, he was doing what he was doing. He thought he was right. Mm -hmm. But then when that Damascus Road experience came, he realized that he was wrong all along. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? How it is when we had that transformation from God and what we think in our mind is totally different. Okay? Paul said here in verse 5, he said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, he said, but our sufficiency is of God. In other words, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm where I am, I'm who I am because of God. And, and Paul wanted to let us know because sometimes we can get too many accolades and we think we're doing it on our own. You know? And, and then we realize, well, you just got a lot of accolades. You're not effective. Because you're too boastful about, I, I got this degree, I got that degree, I got that behind my name, I got that behind my name. That's why we, we lose sight of God. Because of accolade. In John 15 and 5, Jesus said this. And this is show us that we, we are not sufficient on our own self, of our own. In John 15 and 5, Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abide in me and I in him, the same bring, the same bring forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If we are not abiding in him, if there's any kind of ministry that's not connected to the vine, you just spinning your wheels going nowhere. 
tell people a lot of times, you ever seen that hamster in the wheel? <laughs> that hamster in that wheel, he just running, 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 but he ain't going nowhere. He just <laughs> make a lot of noise. In our ministry, we got to stay connected to, to Jesus, to God, and when we're connected to the vine, we're going to stay connected and true to his word. Anytime we get outside the will of God and oh, if I'm on our own idea of how things are supposed to be done, outside the will of God, we're not connected. Okay? And then we wonder why things don't happen. We got to go back and see if we connect. Because it said that, what it said? Reflecting who? God's spirit. Reflecting God's spirit. It's not ourselves, it's God's spirit. Okay? Now, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. So now, he said, but the grace of God, he said, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which walk with me. Okay? What Paul is saying. He said, I, I've done it all. But he didn't say I did it. Paul. He said, I couldn't have done anything without God. Mm -hmm. In other words, Paul said, everything I've done is going to reflect God's. And that's what, that's what we got to do. That's the most important thing. And, and, and you know what? When we, when we get in our mind, what we do, we want to reflect God. We talk about it. We, we come out of a Mount Rose and we want to reflect Mount Rose. No, we want to reflect God. We want to reflect God in our life. Oh, yeah. And then the next thing they want to say is, what church you affiliated with? It, it works that way because it comes from God and we will be affected in our ministry because we are reflecting God. Okay? He said now in verse 6, who had made us able ministers of the New Testament? Not of the letter. He said, not just knowing scripture. I'm going to put it to an everyday language. Yeah. Not just we need to know a lot of scripture. Because you know what? I call them Bible thumping. They probably wouldn't like it. I dealt with a lot of Bible thumpers. They know that scripture. <laughs> They'll tell you that scripture. I mean, there was some that even tell you tell me how much they buy would cost. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got a Schofield and I paid this for it. It don't matter. He said, but now not of the letter, but what? But of the spirit. For the letter do what? Kill it. But the spirit giveth what? Life. Now, what does it mean that the letter kill it? Galatians 3 and 10 put it this way. For as many are as many as are of the work of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curse is everyone that continue not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What are you saying? Okay, let me tell you. Can I put it in everyday language for you? We can know the word from Genesis to Revelation. That's a lot of knowledge. What do you say? If we can remember all of it. <laughs> if we can remember all of it. People tell you, I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, well, go somewhere and then tell me what Isaiah said in 3 and 15. <laughs> oh, don't come up ever. <laughs> See, what I'm saying is that you can, you can read it all, but you, you won't really know it all. But so how do we reflect what we have learned through God's word unless we reflect it through the spirit? Mm -hmm. yeah. See what I'm saying? You can know all of it, but unless we it connect with our spirit and the word of God tells us that God will bring all things to remembrance. So we might not know it. But in time you need it, God will bring it to you. He'll bring it to you. So now, so the letter killers, it means that a lot of times people will, will tell you all this, they know and they know. But I like this.
but the spirit giveth life. Mm -hmm. The spirit giveth life. Now, Romans 8 and 2 put it this way, for the law of the spirit of life is in Christ, has made us, made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, when we notice this, the word, the scripture, we read it, we understand it, we, we, we now got to apply it. Okay? <coughs> so if we don't apply it, it's just like when I got ready for Sunday school to come this morning, if I didn't apply what I've learned, it would be like me getting in the shower this morning and not turning the water on <laughs> or getting a bar of soap. Can I say I shower? Mm -hmm. I just stood in there. Mm -hmm. I would have been just as dirty when I got out as I was when I got in there unless I applied the soap and the dish and the wash cloth. Mm -hmm. Now, to reflect God's spirit, we got to put that word into action. Okay? Now, let's go on with our second outline. Eternal glory. 7 through 13 and read down to verse 12 in your scripture, okay? You, in your book. And if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones is glorious, so that the children of Israel cannot steadfastly behold the face of, the face of Moses, for the glory of his companions, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. For even that which was made glorious has no glory in this respect. By reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away with glory is much more than that which remains is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a vain veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Paul exerts that glory was attached to the Old Testament law because God engraved it on stones himself. But this was a fading glory. Paul cites Moses' experience in Exodus 34, 29 to 35 to explain the glory of the New Testament is great over the Old Testament law. The glory of God was visibly reflected in Moses' face. However, because he knew that this reflection of God's glory would eventually fade, Moses wore a veil over his face to prevent a loss of confidence in him if the people saw the glory disappear. Paul argued that if the ministry that brought death and condemnation to the old covenant was glorious, how much more glorious was the ministry of grace, the new covenant, that produced life through the Spirit? Amen. Thank you, Naisha. Thank you. Eternal glory. Now, this is very deep what Paul said. By the fact that he's talking about reflecting God's glory, talking about the veil. Verse 7 began Paul comparison of God's glory as revealed in the Old and New Testament. Although he described the Old Covenant as the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, he acknowledged that it reflects God's glory because he was its author. Mm -hmm. However, the supernatural glow of Moses' face after talking with God frightened the people because they recognized that they exposed their sinfulness and made them unworthy to look at God's glory. In the book of Exodus, I believe, when Paul, when, when Moses went up on the mountain and he was in the presence of God, 
the Israelites were down in the wilderness, fussing, complaining, carrying on. And Moses was interceding between God and them. When Moses came down, they, Moses didn't look the same to them. And they was complaining that Moses wasn't coming back. But when he did, he looked different. And they didn't understand. So, now when, like Moses, when we spend time with God, devotional time, intimate time with God, in prayer and meditation in his word, don't you think that we would have a different reflection? Should we? We, 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 you know, I might still look like Sam, but I should have a little different about me. If I'm the same person, after I said that I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm the same person. The first thing you're going to say, he's lying. <laughs> I believe that every one of us in here can attest for yourself that you're not the same person you always been. That's right. We're not all the same person you always been. So that tells us that we have grown somewhere. Right? Okay. Some of them are just grown. And some of them are just grown in Christ. If we have grown in our walk with Christ, we ought to begin, or should have already begun to reflect that in our life. Verse 7 says, but if the ministration, which is the ministry of death, written and engraved in stone was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance or his look, which glory was to be done away. Now, Moses' mission was coming to an end. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Ministration of the Spirit means that, okay, we're talking about God's Spirit. Moses had been in the presence of God. So now Moses' mission had come to an end. So now we're not following Moses. We're following God. Remember what we're following to call Jesus and I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit that will lead and to guide you into all truth. So that's what we need. So now when you, when you get the Spirit, the Spirit will bring about a change. It shouldn't just make you jump for a little while. It'll rest on you. Rest in your heart. Rest in your mind. And, and, and after a while, you say, you know what? They look different. I believe God will really make a change. That's what it should do. Galatians 3 and 5 So he therefore the ministers minister to you the spirit and working miracle among you do he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. We hear the word Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It shouldn't go in one ear and out the other. In other words, it traveled this way, but it should go this way. In our heart. Take it and apply it. For the ministration, the ministry of condemnation, be glorious much more do the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now, I'm going to read this from the NIV. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Ministry of the Spirit. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry to bring righteousness? Now, 
Everything, I know for the last two or three Sundays, somewhere we talked about the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to God. Okay? In other words, the, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to God to see our <coughs> faults, see our sinful nature. So when we see that now, with, since that has showed us our sinful nature, we want to change. We should have a desire to change, to reflect God, because to get to be with him, we got to be like him. Understand? To get to be with God, we got to be like him. We got to reflect God in our life. We won't be able to sneak in. Oh no. Because God knows our heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. So God's going to know our true person. Okay? Now, for even that which was made glorious had, not, had no glory in respect by reason of glory that excelled. What glory, for what glory has no glory now is compared with the glory, surpassing glory. Now, at the time, what this is saying, at the time, Paul is drawing a comparison between what Moses done to the children, for the children of Israel in the, in the name of God. Moses was reflecting his presence with God, or God present with Moses. He was reflecting that. But that came to an end. Okay? These Corinthians still were thinking that we need to continue the law. We cannot just continue the law. There got to be a transition. Okay? All right, I'm going to make it plain to you. We just can't keep coming to church. <laughs> there got to be a transition. Okay? If we want to go with him, we got to be like him. Well, we can't be like God. We can reflect God. We can reflect God. We're not perfect. But do we even try to be? Do we even try to strive to be more like him? That's how we're going to have the drawing power. When somebody sees us, we, they ought to be just like those in the, in the, in the wilderness when they saw Moses. When they saw Moses, they behold Moses, he didn't look the same, and they knew Moses had been with God. So when they see us, they might reflect or see that, you know what? That's a change. Because I'm pretty sure nobody like this being the same person all the time. That's the same old, same old. There are some people that I have met and talked to that would actually tell me I'm just tired of living this way. That's a good confession. When you meet somebody and they tell you, they know that you reflect God in your life and they tell you, I'm tired of living this way, that's an open door to your ministry. That's an open door to your ministry. In other words, that person have, have took the veil off their heart. They want to allow the spirit of God to come in. But the reason why sometimes I don't want to talk to them is because we don't reflect I'm just being honest. We got to reflect. Now, seeing that, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfast look to the end of that which is abolished. The law was abolished. Then Jesus, in a, in a sense, what Moses was done. But you know what? I thought of this. Mm. Moses was a great leader. But God uh, didn't allow Moses to go into the promised land. Okay? Was it because Moses was such a bad person? No. Moses' mission was what God had Moses to do it come to an end. Okay? The Moses did not miss going to heaven. Because the Bible said he was seen on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
At that time, he had done what God wanted him to do. All right. Now, we're going to go on because we're getting in now. We're going to go on with verses 14 through 18. I'm going to handle here. Now, 14 said, but their minds were blinded. For until the day remained the same veil, what? Untaken away. In the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ? Veil mm. was taken away. He said, This veil was untaken away. But their mind was what? Blinded. Let me tell you something. I put a note down. I want to say, let us remember that it's hard to change people when they got their mind set. It is. Mm -hmm. Only God mm -hmm. can change me. Y'all believe that? Mm -hmm. I see a few nods. Yeah. When people got their mind set, <laughs> they got to remove the veil. Oh, yeah. Well, what you're talking about, Sam, they got to remove the veil because the scripture said, Jesus said, I stand at the door yeah. and knock. Mm -hmm. If any man <laughs> will open up, that's the door to your life, your heart, Amen. the door to your home. Yes. Anything. Mm -hmm. The responsibility is on us. Yes. We got to open up and let God come in. God. If we don't open up and let God come in, it's not God's fault. Mm -hmm. It's our fault. Mm -hmm. Stubbornness. Mm -hmm. The day you hear my voice, heart not your heart. People said, I, I know that's what the Bible said, but I'm going to stay hard. Okay. <laughs> mm. And you know, I, I thought about it yesterday, Pastor. There have been a lot of deathbed confessions. Mm -hmm. Y'all used to hear old people talk about deathbed confessions? Mm -hmm. People have lived their life the way they want all their life. And right there when they at the getting ready to leave here, they realize the only way to be with God, I got to give it up. And we thank God for his, for his mercy. Yes, Lord. It is God's desire that no man should perish. Yes, and, and let me tell y'all something. That, that sometimes going to be some deathbed confession. Mm -hmm. But you know what God is so merciful? I thought about that this morning. God is so merciful. Remember Hezekiah? He told him, tell him I'm going to be to leave here. But he said he put his face towards toward the wall and prayed and God gave him another 15 years. Mm -hmm. Ain't that mercy? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yes. Heaven kind of was about getting ready to have a deathbed confession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but God was merciful that he gave him another chance. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. But I don't want us to play it that, that close. Mm -hmm. When we sit here Sunday after yeah. Sunday after Sunday in here, let's not play it that close. Mm -hmm. Because if we decide that we don't want to play it that close, we can enjoy life more. All right. Life in Christ. Okay? Now, oh God, check it out. But even until this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon what? Yeah. Their hearts. The veil is upon their hearts. What do you mean? They don't want to let God in. Bible said when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent from top to bottom, gave up access to God. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When we turn to God, open up our hearts, open up the door to our lives, to our homes, or whatever, to our church. And allow God to come in and give God access. A lot of times we don't want to do it because we don't want God in our life. We want the benefits of God, but we don't want to do nothing else. Mm -hmm. We want the benefit, but we don't want nothing else. Mm -hmm. So now, the Lord is that spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, that's liberty. That's freedom. 
where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Want to know why some people walk around mean and mad? And everybody. Yes, sir. The problem could be right there. The problem could be right there. Let God in. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Liberty is freedom. Rejoice. You can love. You can really embrace one another. Oh, yeah. Once we open up our heart. Because let me tell you something. I ain't using nobody else. My way. If I want to do it my way, guess who, who is going to cause more problems? <laughs> Doing it my way? If I don't give it up, but I already have. I'm just using the example. Yeah. <laughs> if I didn't give it up, I already did for a But I'm saying if I would just want to be my way, I could be one of the Lord I, on a deathbed. But no. I've learned that when we allow God to come in, our life is so complete, so full, because we're being led by the Spirit. Okay, come on, Pastor. But we all, with open faith, behold that in a glass the glory of the Lord are chained into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. Now, when we look in the mirror this morning, we see a reflection of ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we see a reflection of ourselves, I know when I look in there, I'm like, oh boy, you get a little gray around here. <laughs> I see that. That let me know I'm changing. But when I look in the mirror, I don't see nobody else but me. I reflect my image. When we look in the mirror and we see we're changing from faith to faith, we all see God in us. Let God, I'm going to tell you this, and this, this is hard. We, we have to realize, and it's no game. It's no game. God gave us so many warnings about trying to do things our way. Hear this word and let it go in one ear out of the other. Maybe it's because of who it comes from. Mm -hmm. If it don't work on nobody else, I want it to work on me. Because I'm the one that's going to have to stand before God and give an account of the deed done in this life, oh, yeah. whether they're good or bad. Oh, yeah. That's what God words say. I was thinking about a, a meeting we had in Detroit with the, uh, the transportation department uh, when they were building 75 and Interstate 10 running through the city. And it, it surprised me that uh, they put a protocol in there that no interstate where they designed and made will go straight all the time. I wonder why it go straight all the time. So in other words, when they designed it now that when you know, it goes straight a while, then they got a bend in it. Then they got a curve in it. Then they got to upgrade a hill. Then they got to downset. Mm -hmm. Cause it couldn't, it couldn't be straight always. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's the way our life is. Mm -hmm. You can't go straight all the way. Mm -hmm. God put it that way. That you got to go around the bend. You got to yield. You got to go up here. Mm -hmm. And then we so anxious to get to glory. Mm -hmm. And he he got more emphasis on us during the journey. Right. You know what the journey is, don't you? It got some bends. It got some trials in it. And we have to go through that that we'll learn how to appreciate what we do get when we get home. So it seems like God is more focused on uh, still uh, uh, wiping our tears we got to go through something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got to dislike something. And then when you get your mind out, why it happened this way? Why we do this? 
sometimes God take you the long way. Because if they would have went the short way in Exodus, mm -hmm. they would have ran into the Philistine. Mm -hmm. And that was a wall that they couldn't win. Mm -hmm. But it took them the long way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. And still had the enemy think they was winning when they was at the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that people try to trap you. They read us a bait. Because they don't get trapped themselves. And that's what happened to the Israelite enemies. Mm -hmm. They were drowning in the Red Sea because they thought they had them trapped. So mm -hmm. let us continue to read the Word of God and encourage one another mm -hmm. and enlighten one another that we can continue on this journey and let the Holy Spirit be our guide. Oh, yeah. It's in us. Amen. But we just got to let it overshadow us to make our decisions. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, so uh, we want to this uh, miss with our superintendent. I do have one announcement here. It's Bethany Number 2 Baptist District Women Convention to the Bethany Number 2 Pastors, Churches, and Missionary Societies of the District. I hope to find I hope to find each of you in good health and good spirit. And this letter appeal is to inform and make requests of you of the following items. Fashion share. Again, this year the Alabama Baptist State Women's Convention is requesting gift requested gift cards in the amount of ten dollars each for their fashion share effort. These gift cards are given to women who are in abuse situation and women who are incarcerated. I'm asking each mission society and members to purchase a gift card and mail to me with the address and clothes, or you can cash out to Miss Barbara, 4276 and 11 June 8. I will purchase the cards and they will be turned in at the state convention, which will be held June 10th through 12th in Millbrook at the Good Ship Missionary Baptist Church. A special effort for Southwest District Women Convention, I am asking each church and mission society to give $50 for Seven University. Our second vice president, Sister Bonnie Kyle, will make this report during the Selma University Special Effort March. The Southwestern District Convention will convene on June 24th, held at the Corinthians Missionary Baptist Church in Mobile. She had banquet tickets, $60 per person, for the annual fellowship banquet to be held on Monday night, June 24th. If you desire to purchase a ticket, you may contact her with the number enclosed here. The Fifth Sunday Fellowship, the Missionary the Mission Auxiliary will host the service on Sunday, June 30th at 2 o'clock p.m. at the Baptist Center in Morovia. Pastor Larry Moore of the Bright Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church of Frisco City will deliver the message. We ask each church to represent with $25 or $125 for the year. We invite all to come and share the fellowship with the sisters and brothers of the district. Again, thank you for your cooperation and participation. All for the cause of kingdom building. God bless and keep you as he has always done and will continue to do. Your servant in Christ is the Barbara A. Dukes president. If you would like more information, <coughs> uh, come up and read this letter as well. Stand for our closing prayer. Dear God, come to have some 